In this lesson, we're going to talk about functions and change. So first off, a function is basically just a rule. That rule will take an input and assign it to an output. Now that output has to have some sort of special characteristic where it is unique, meaning that when you put a particular input, you're going to get that output with no question of what the output would be. For example, suppose your function is a freezer. If your input is water and you give it sufficient time, you should not expect your output to be anything but ice. It is exactly what you would expect it to be, and that's the idea of a function. An input will create an output that you can always get just one output. If you take all the input numbers, or perhaps you could think of it as all the values x can take, we call that the domain of the function, and the resulting outputs, we would call that the range. So these are the ones that come from these inputs. We often will call the input the independent variable, which is usually x, and the dependent variable, which is usually y, is the output. One thing I like to throw out there is this little phrase, y is a function of x. If we remember that, it helps us keep things organized as to which one is the input and which one is the output, because you're kind of used to the idea of y equals f of x. So y is a function of x. So now let's take a look. We've got the table of snowfall in Syracuse, December 5th through 16th of 2010. Now here's where I said this is important explain why the snowfall is a function of the date. Now remember, y is a function of x. So y is a function of x. That means y is the snowfall and x is the date. Now when we think of it like that, we're used to x being our independent variable and y being our dependent variable. With that said, for every x, if we get a unique y, we're good. Now let me tell you a little bit more about what I mean by a unique y. You can see in this table that every x is different, and that's fine. However, notice that every y is not necessarily different. So if a y is the same, is that okay? Sure. The problem would be if I had, say, an 11 matched up to multiple values of y. Say that the 11 showed up twice in the table, and there were different values of y. That would say that the input of 11 went to two different outputs. But the fact of the matter is, each number, say 11, goes to one output. Even though 12 goes to the same value of 0, 0.0, that's okay. So with that said, snowfall is a function of the date, since each date is associated with only one amount of snowfall. Now the question also asks for the domain and range. For the domain, we often use these curly brackets to describe a set. You don't need to know a lot of detail about how sets work, but just know that for this example, I'm going to use curly brackets. So the domain is all the values that x can take, or at least you can think of it as the input. So this is exactly what you would think it would be. 5, 6, 7, and so on. Now for the range, we're going to do the same thing. It's going to be the set of all the output values. However, there's one thing I want to point out when we get there. Let's start writing these down. Your range would be 6.8, 12.2, 9.3, and so on. But now this 0, 0.0 showed up twice. One of the things about sets is it doesn't need repeats. So I'm just making a list of all the possibilities. I don't need to show the 0, 0.0 twice. And then we'll finish it off. And there's your range. Now when we talk about domain and range, in this example, we had what we call discrete data, where it takes on isolated values. But you can also have continuous data, where it can take on really any value whatsoever. Time is often a good example of this, because time flows in a continuum. There's not really a discrete set. Sure, you could say one second, two second, three second, but remember that time does not just get measured in single seconds. We can really break it down into as small of time intervals as we want. So with this in mind, we can also talk about closed intervals and open intervals used to show the idea of continuous data. The only thing I want to point out is for the closed interval, you'll notice we have less than or equal to symbols. And for the open interval, you'll notice we have strictly less than symbols. So a little key point for this is bracket means to include the endpoint, and parentheses mean don't include the endpoint. So let's look at this example. You have a function for the height of a ball when it's thrown in the air. 
The ball is thrown at time zero and hits the ground after three seconds. Now it doesn't really give us much detail as to how the height works, that sort of thing. But what is the domain of this function? Well again, the domain is all the values of your input. So your input in this case is time. Well, that's pretty simple then. It started at time zero, and we'll include that endpoint. And then it ended at time three, and we'll also include that endpoint. Data can be often described in four different ways. Tables, graphs, formulas, and words. Now the thing about this different way of describing data is some versions are useful for certain kinds of data and some versions are not useful for some kinds of data. For example, here's your snowfall example. This was given to us in a table before. Here's a graph of the snowfall. Now this graph is not all that meaningful, shown as a scatter plot. So we would probably rather have it given as a table. Also, if it's given as a table, we can quickly look at the given day and get the exact value without having to guess on the scale of this graph. In our second example, the function was described by just simply a ball being thrown in the air. It was a word definition, which was fine, but perhaps if we needed more detail, there would have been a better way to do it. Here's a great example of when you do want to graph for the data. This is what we call an EKG a graphical depiction of a person's electrical activity in their heartbeat. Basically, a doctor wants to be able to look at this and say, yeah, that's a good, healthy patient. Their heartbeat is nice and regular. But if they see an EKG where it's all over the place, then they can tell there's a problem. Now, if this data were presented in any other way, like a table, that would be really, really difficult for the doctor to look at it and just say, yep, that's a good activity. Finally, let's take an example of a good way to look at data with a formula. Here's an example about the snow tree cricket. It's known to chirp faster or slower depending on the temperature. Generally speaking, the higher the temperature, the faster it chirps, the lower the temperature, the slower it chirps. So using enough research, scientists discovered that they could use this equation, C equals 4T minus 60, where T is in Fahrenheit, and C is the number of chirps per minute. So this is a great time to use a formula to describe what's going on here. Yes, you could use a table, but this would be a very large table given a huge variety of temperatures that could happen. So this is what we call a mathematical model. It's some sort of description of a real life situation that often comes with an equation or something along that line. Now the problem with models is a lot of times we have to simplify reality to make this model work. This one's probably pretty accurate, but there are many things that are very difficult for us to describe carefully. One such example is simply the gravity equation. There's a function that will describe how far something has traveled after falling for so long, but it has to ignore air resistance. And when you fall far enough, air resistance is a big deal. Another thing is, oftentimes the domain of an idea could be discrete, but to actually make it a function, we might have to use this idea of continuous and make an interval of numbers to define it. Here's the function notation we tend to use. If we say y is a function of t, then we will write y equals f, and this is read of t. This has nothing to do with multiplication. In this case, the independent variable is inside the parentheses, the independent variable t, that's our input. The dependent variable is y, our output, and we give the function the name f. Surprising letter, f for function. From there we can talk about the concept of the intercept. The intercept of a function is where it can cross one of the axes. A lot of times we call these x-intercepts and y-intercepts, but we'll use the term horizontal intercept for x-intercept and vertical intercept for y-intercept. When we do it that way, we can change up our variables a little bit more. The horizontal intercepts, or what you would often call the x-intercepts, are often called the zeros of the function as well. So now let's take an example of this. Here's your cricket formula that we had a minute ago. This is a function of t, where again t was the temperature in Fahrenheit. We're going to set f of t equal to 0 and interpret this result. So that means I need to take the equation 4t minus 160 is equal to 0. Now using a little bit of algebra, I'll add 160 to both sides, which gives me 4t equals 160. And then I can divide by 4 to get 40. Remember t was in degrees Fahrenheit. And it might be worth noting that setting it equal to zero is saying c is equal to zero chirps per minute. So when we're looking at these intercepts, 
oftentimes we want to make an association where one variable is zero and the other variable is found to be some value. And then to write out what that means, we'll simply take the two variables and put them together in a sentence. In this case, we'll say this. When the temperature reaches 40 degrees Fahrenheit, the crickets stop chirping. Zero chirps per minute, they stop chirping. Here's another example of interpreting a function. The value of a car is a function of the age of the car. We'll call this a function g, because g is the next letter after f, and then let's take a look at this example. If g of 5 is equal to 9, let's just label it. That means that a is 5 and v is 9. v is in thousands of dollars and a is in years. So just write a sentence that puts 5 years together with $9,000. After 5 years, the vehicle is worth $9,000. Now let's look at another function like this. The value of a Honda is approximated by g of a is equal to 13.78 minus 0.8a. Now we want to do the vertical and horizontal intercepts of this graph. For the vertical, that means we need to set the independent variable, a is equal to zero. So then I'll just simply calculate g of zero. That's 13.78 minus 0 0.8 times zero. That's 13.78. So now let's just write a sentence to match up with that. The age was zero years, so the car is brand new. And the value of the car was 13.78, but remember that was in thousands of dollars. So when I write my answer, I'll interpret that in just dollars. The car is worth $13,780 when it is brand new. Now for the horizontal intercept, we're going to set the value equal to zero, which is the same thing as setting the function equal to zero. We're going to say 13.78 minus 0.8a is equal to 0. Let's add the 0.8a to the other side to get 13.78 equals 0.8a. And I'll switch the order, but I'm going to divide by 0.8. I get a equals 13.78 divided by 0.8 is 17.225. Let's just leave that number as is. And remember, that number will be in years. Now this might not necessarily be accurate because a car is never completely down to a value of zero. It's always worth a scrap metal amount. But let's write this down as though that's possible. After 17.225 years, the car is worth nothing. Totally worthless. For this last slide, let's just analyze a couple of the examples that we had. For the chirp example, the values for the chirps per minute increased as the temperature increased. But for that Honda example, we saw that the car's value decreased as the age increased. This is the idea of an increasing and decreasing function. A function will be increasing if the values of the function increase as x increases. That seems pretty straightforward. And this is the picture of what's going on here. The function rises as x rises. Now decreasing, be careful with your words. The function is decreasing if the values of the function decrease as x increases. So x is going to be getting bigger, but the function is going to be getting smaller. And that looks like this.